Okay, let's continue. So now we're back to Revelation chapter 6 where Jesus Christ, now the Lamb, starts to break open uh, the, the seals uh, on, the, um, on the scroll. So, Revelation 6 verse 1. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals, and then I heard the one one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, "Come!" I looked, and there before me was a white horse; its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. So, very likely, this uh, is the introduction of the Antichrist. Power was given to him, and he is now riding out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Right? Verse 3, then when the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! And then another horse came out. This was a fiery red one, and its rider was given power to what? To take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other and to him was given a large sword so to this writer he has power given to him interesting choice of words because it's just that and we just read about that in Daniel to what to make war and what what did we see in Daniel we saw this this fiery campaign military campaign by the Antichrist through the Middle East theater um, and also, not only was he given power, so it's like he pops up and he's given power, he's not royalty, but he's given a large sword. And we, we compared of this to what had recently happened in Afghanistan, where in 10 days' time, the Taliban, they came in, uh, o overtook Afghanistan, the president left, he fled the country, and the most powerful military force in the world left the country, almost like with our tail between our legs. And what did we leave behind? A very large sword. All this U.S. Uh, sophisticated weaponry, like $85 billion worth, now given to the Taliban. All right? So... You, we Sometimes we read prophecy and it's like, I don't see how that can happen. Well, guess what? It can happen just like that. So, what do we expect out of the fiery red horse? A whole series of military campaigns in the Middle East. Then we saw the third seal. Uh, and now uh, there's a rider on a black horse. And this rider is holding a pair of scales in his hand. And then we heard what sounded like a voice in heaven saying... Giving instructions, what? Two pounds of wheat for a day's wages, six pounds of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and wine. So what? this is nothing more than a the typical fulfillment of what happens after a war, especially a serious war or series of war, where crops are destroyed, supply lines are destroyed, uh, transportation system is destroyed. What? Then there's a massive shortage of essential goods and services and foods. And what is this going to what's going to happen out of all this? This will basically set the stage with the Antichrist now to implement his system of pledging loyalty to him through the mark of the beast if you want to purchase and sell any of these essential goods and services. And then what comes out of all of this? The tearing off of the fourth seal. And here now we have a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. But there's more than that. Because besides this pale horse and its rider, following close behind is Hades. Whoa, what does all this mean? And they, both Death and Hades, were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, by famine, by plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. So once again, these writers are given power over a fourth of the earth, which, oh, by the way, about a fourth of the earth is basically true Christians. Hmm, what a coincidence. Uh, the consequences, however, they're going to be horrific. Not only with physical death of martyrdom, 
expect to see a lot of martyrdom, but uh, martyrdom is nothing more than standing up to who you believe in and refusing to bow to the Antichrist, the beast. Um, that will be physical death. But if they give in and they disavow Jesus Christ and they give their allegiance to the Antichrist and take the mark of the beast, then guess what? There is spiritual death as well. That would be Hades following close behind. And then by sword and famine and, and plague, uh, those were pretty well understood, but by wild beasts of the earth, that didn't quite make sense. And so we went back to the original Greek and found out, oh, wild beast comes from the word therion. And uh, yeah, it can mean a beast. It can mean an animal. Uh, it could be a wild animal, even though the word wild is not there in, in the Greek, but it could also mean a brute. A brutish man. Oh, wait a minute. The Antichrist, that's a brutish man. So all of a sudden, uh, going back to the original language starts to help make sense. And then we looked and go, well, is there any of this uh, being fulfilled in, uh, prophetically or in the Old Testament? So we're looking at sword and famine and plague and, and of course, wild beasts. And all of a sudden, what? We looked at Old Testament prophecies and sword and famine and wild beasts and pestilence um, and more pestilence and hunger and plague and more pestilence and beasts and sword. Yes, it's all there and it's there for your review if you choose to look at it. Ezekiel, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. Okay, now we get to the fifth seal. The fifth seal. Now remember what ended in the fourth seal was what? death in Hades, or martyrdom, or joining the forces of the Antichrist and giving, paying homage to the Antichrist. And now we got the opening of the fifth seal, and all of a sudden, under the altar, the souls of those who have been slain for the word of God. These are martyrs. And for the witness they had borne, so they refused to back down. Uh, and, you know, we, we talked about if, the, if we're ever up in a scenario like this, we need to be prepared. We need to be mentally prepared, spiritually prepared. And um, what do we say? And for me, it will be I choose to obey God rather than man. Under the altar, that was an interesting choice of words, but under the altars where the Levitical priests were instructed to pour out what? The excess blood of sacrifice. So if there was too much blood for the sacrifice, they had to pour it under the altar. Okay? So, these are not casualties due to events associated with the Great tri Tribulation. So this, in other words, this is not like people dying from like an incoming missile. These are people that are martyred because of their beliefs. They are slain because of the testimony of the gospel. All right? Uh, in fact, the, the saints as defined in Revelation is what? The people of God, be it Jew or Gentile, who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. But there's more to this. Um, because we got these, these uh, souls that are crying out in a loud voice, and they're saying, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? All right? So, this once again, this tells us these are martyred believers. This also tells us that there's a level of consciousness. They know why they're there. They know what was going on in earth when they were killed. They're now asking God to avenge their deaths. Okay? And they know that this is not the wrath of God as a result of their death. This is the wrath of Satan, the wrath of, of uh, the Antichrist, the wrath of the false prophet. This is because of evil doing, all right? And their answer, they're given white robes. They're told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves have been. Remember, this is a righteous decree by God. 
This is not Satan getting away with what he thinks uh, is his plan. This is God's plan. Until the number of their fellow servants and brothers should be complete. Until the fullness of the, uh, the Gentiles, the numbers of the Gentiles. So, this tells us that Revelation 13, 7 is exactly what it says. The Antichrist was there to make war on the saints and to conquer them. All we read about that in Daniel. That's the reason why we went through Daniel. And authority was given it. All we read about that in Daniel. Over every tribe and people and language and nation. The importance of Daniel. So then we looked very briefly at martyrdom in general. What is the biblical definition of martyrdom in the context of the end of times? All very important. Revelation 20 it says they were beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. John 16, God, uh, Jesus says, whoever kills you, well, they're going to think that they're offering their service to God. Interesting. Very, very interesting. In Matthew, he also says, Then they, the Antichrist, and his uh, armies will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you'll be hated by all nations. So this is going to be a global phenomenon. Why? For my name's sake. So this tells us we're talking about Christians, not Orthodox Jews that do not recognize Yeshua as their Messiah. These are Christians being killed for the namesake of Jesus. And then what we just read, the fifth seal, um, for the witness they've borne. Okay. So, end time persecution is defined scripturally. It's going to be very anti-Christian, very anti-Semitic. There's going to be beheadings. There's going to be a belief by those doing all of this that they're doing this for God. That they're divinely appointed to kill these non believers. Let's call them infidels. And it will be a global moment. So then with that in mind, we looked once again, does the Roman Empire fulfill this or the Islamic Caliphate, the Ottoman Empire? Well, we saw very quickly uh, Islam's hatred of Jews and quote unquote and their supporters, Christians, is alive and well in Islam, in the Quran. Uh, where it says, amongst them, them being the Jews, we have placed enmity and hatred till the day of judgment. Their teachings, uh, had, called hadiths, as, uh, talks about the last hour. It's not going to come unless the Muslims will fight against the Jews and the Muslims would kill them. Hmm. Right out of Revelation. Right out of Daniel. And then we got these imams. This one is a Palestinian authority. And one of his public prayers is saying, Allah annihilate the Jews and their supporters. That would be the Christians. Oh Allah, raise the flag of jihad across the land. And we talked about the white flag and the black flag of Islam and how the Islamic teachings is that the black flag is going to come uh, from the east. So from uh, the, the stand states, you know, Kazakhstan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, pa um, on and on. And will, and will be planted at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. We looked at beheading. Well, guess what? That is Islam's preference of killings as a means of intimidation and instilling terror, forcing people to make a choice, either bow to Allah and Islam or off with your head. And then we looked at some of their teachings and histor history. History, there's there's been all sorts of bloodshed. I'll pick on the middle one. 1842, the Afghani Muslims overtook the British garrison in Kabul. And what? Beheaded over 2,000 men and women and children. And their heads were placed on sticks around the city as decorations. Okay, there's a hadith uh, that basically says if a man uh, disputes against the caliph's authority, they should be beheaded. So if you stand up for your belief, which is contrary to Islam, off with your head. 
We looked at some of the more recent news, uh, CBS, where they're reporting the Saudi government routinely every year. They behead uh, men and women uh, for their crimes. Washington Times, uh, they quoted a former director of the Islamic Center in Washington, D.C. And basically he's saying you can't do it like the idiots on TV. The right way is to slit the person's throat and not cut off the entire head. So interesting commentary. Christian Daily was reporting were Somalians who were suspected to have converted to Christianity. What? They, they, they rushed them out and did public beheadings without trials. What about a global campaign? Well, in the Quran, uh, basically in their scripture, it says uh, when the sacred months have passed away, so that would be like uh, the Hajj and uh, Ramadan, then slay the idolaters wherever you find them. Um, another verse is when you encounter the infidels, strike off their heads. There's also a law of kesis, which is reciprocity, and that's nothing more than uh, thou shalt not kill, but if you're killing somebody that's opposed to Islam, that's okay. Global campaign. Uh, we looked at some historians. Uh, we, here's one quote in the Muslim community. The holy war is a religious duty because of the universalism of the Muslim mission and to convert everybody to Islam either by persuasion or by force. Here's another uh, quote from Omar Ahmed, uh, Council on American Islamic Relations, the CAIR. You've probably heard of them before. They're based in Washington, D.C. Here's his quote. Probably a, a translation out of Arabic, but Islam isn't in America to be equal to any other faith but to become dominant. The Quran should be the highest authority in America. They don't believe in freedom of religion, none whatsoever. And Islam is the only accepted religion, the only accepted religion on earth. That's a message of intolerance. Dreadful, terrifying, right out of Daniel. So, for the, the, the biblical definition of end time martyrdom, uh, very anti Christian, anti Semitic, yep, beheadings, yep, belief that, view, that they view themselves as divinely appointed to kill the non believers, absolutely, and a global movement, yes. So, therefore, the expectation of end time persecution is going to entail an Islamic jihadi uh, movement. So, we need to be prepared. We need to know our enemy. And this is something that's very, very important. The very important line of distinction. Our enemy here is Islam, not Muslims. In fact, our heart, our hope, our desire is that none should perish. Our heart's desire is that we will be able to lead many Muslims to the real Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, not their Messiah, which is called Mahdi. So, from there, we looked at Jacob's trouble uh, and also Jacob's redemption and the battle of Gog and Magog, the prophecy there in Ezekiel 38 and 39. So, first, Jacob's trouble, because this is so important to help us understand. What is Jacob's trouble? Well, it's clearly defined in Jeremiah 30. How awful that day will be. No other will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob. Who's Jacob? Israel. But he will be saved out of it. So it's going to be a time of trouble, but there will be salvation. I am with you to save you, declares the Lord, though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you. We read about that earlier, all these Islamic nations. I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you. He disciplines those he loves, but only in due measure. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. And the fierce anger of the Lord, Yahweh, will not turn back until what? He has executed and accomplished the intentions of his mind. In the days to come, you will understand this. The word here, to come, is Ahariot, and it means in the days on the far side, on the other side, at the end of times, 
Okay? Very, very important word because we will see this more in Zechariah. We've read about this, and uh, that was part of our, our earlier uh, refresher, uh, where two-thirds of the Jewish people are going to be cut off and perish in Jacob's trouble. And only a one-third is going to be left alive, and this third, even, is going, God is going to put them into the fire and refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested. And then after all of this, after they're completely broken, they will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people. They will say the Lord is my God. As we read earlier in, Ze in Zechariah, they will recognize the one whom they had pierced as their Savior, Yeshua as the Messiah. Deuteronomy, even Moses says, for I know that after my death, you're sure to become utterly corrupt and to turn uh, from the way I have commanded you in the days to come. This is a Ahariot again. At the end of time, disaster will follow on you because you do evil in the sight of the Lord and arouse his anger by, uh, by what your hands have made. Okay, so, all right, I think we got an understanding of what Jacob's trouble is all about. How does that compare to Israel today? Well, let's look at that. What's the spiritual state of Israel today? Israel is one of the more secular countries in the world. A large percentage identify either as agnostic or atheist, New Age, or Eastern religions. In fact, very, very few Messianic Jews exist um, in, in Israel. Uh, even many of the Orthodox Jews, they claim they do not believe in God. They're very, very secular. Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv claims to be the gayest city on earth. That would put them right up there with Sodom and Gomorrah. In 2018, they had a gay pride, gay pride parade, and that parade was estimated at 250,000 participants. They got a high abortion rate, very high, but before it comes to our heads, uh, not as high as the United States. So the Lord is far from pleased with the United States. Beware. And those many Jews that practice Jewish customs, uh, they do it more out of their cultural identity without worshiping God. So in Paul's words, in Romans 2.24, he says, the name of God is blasphemed. Why? Among the Gentiles? Because of you. Because of you, my Jewish people. So with that, we went into Ezekiel 38 and 39, which expounds on Jacob's trouble and also on the battle of Armageddon and the Antichrist. So we started off in Ezekiel 38, 1, where the Lord came uh, to uh, Ezekiel and said, set your face towards Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Who's him? This is the Antichrist. And say, thus say the Lord God, I am against you, O God, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks in your jaws, and I will force you, I will bring you out, and all your army, so your whole, uh, the, the whole uh, kingdom of the Antichrist, and the armies of the Antichrist, all of them clothed in full armor, I'm going to bring them to Israel. <clears throat> and then he starts talking about some of the countries that are going to be involved. Persia, Kush, Put, Gomer, Beth Tarma. This is Turkey, Iran, Sudan, Libya. Once again, all Islamic countries. Uh, one thing here, chief prince of Meshach, the word chief is, is Hebrew and it's Ross. And it means... The head of the body, chief prince. So the Antichrist is head of his his kingdom, high in status of authority, uh, means a leader. But also, interesting enough, it means the same word can also mean behead or restore to a position. Okay, behead, we just talked about that. Restored to a position, that would be the resurrection of a previous kingdom. You think these Hebrew words are just coincidental? 
far, far from it. Now, sadly, the, NS, the NASB and the American Standard uh, Bible, they do not translate the word Ross. They transliterate it. And so it's the passage reads, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Oh, well, Rosh is one of the three kingdoms here. Rosh, that sounds like Rosha, which is an English word, by the way. And so you have theologians out there going, ah, it's the Russians. The Russians, the Russians, they're coming from the north, and it's going to be the Russians that uh, fulfill prophecy. And that is far from scriptural. So the countries mentioned here, what do they surround hmm, Israel? Um, are they part of, and then of course you look at Saudi Arabia, it's like, wow, they're not part of that. Well, they they got a role to play too. It's just not here. Verse 14, so God says on that day, we know what on that day is, when my people, Israel, are dwelling securely, what? I'm going to bring you in. You will come from your place out of the uttermost parts of the north, you and many people, uh, riding on horses, a my, great host, a mighty army. You will come up against my people. I am orchestrating this, says God. I am orchestrating where you're going to come against my people. Whoa. Like a cloud covering the land in the latter days. Once again, no wiggle room for what we're talking about. This is the end of times. I will bring you against my land that the nations may know me when you, O oh God, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. So, this is very, very personal to God. Thus says the Lord God, I am against you. Uh, I, will, I will strike you. When I bring you in, guess what? I will strike your bow from your left hand, make your arrows drop out of your right hand. You shall fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all your hordes and the peoples who are with you. And I will give you to the birds of prey, to every sort of beast of the field, to be devoured. The birds of prey are going to devour on your bodies. And what do we read about in Revelation 19? The angel calling all the birds of the air to come and feast on the casualties of the kings and great men and warriors and their animals on the battlefield from the Battle of Armageddon. He goes on in verse chapter uh, 39, verse 5, You shall fall in the open field. I will send fire on Magog on the Antichrist, and on those who dwell securely in the coastlands, and they shall know that I am the Lord Yahweh. And my holy name I will make known in the midst of my people, Israel. I will not let my holy name be profane anymore. God is angry at his own people. And the nations shall know that I am Yahweh, the Holy One, in Israel. Behold, it is coming, and it will be brought about, declares the Lord God, that is the day of which I have spoken. Now, something very interesting, and that is, he says, I am the Lord, the Holy One, in Israel. Believe it or not, this is the only place in the Holy Bible where God says, I am, I, at, on that day, I am the Lord, the Holy One, in Israel. All the other passages speaks of him of Israel. I'm the Holy One of Israel. But I'm the Holy One in Israel. What does that tell us? He's going to take up residence in Israel. He's going to establish his throne on Mount Zion. This is, this is the Lord's prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 11, on that day I will give Gog a place for burial in Israel east of the sea. And then he talks about for seven months, the house of Israel will be burying uh, casualties from this war, from this battle, in order to cleanse the land. And on that day, I will show my glory. Um, and he's talking about at the end of seven months, every now and then, there somebody's going to find a bone. And when they do that, they're going to mark it, and there will be barriers assigned to go bury it in the valley of Hamangog.
very, very sobering prophecy. And one thing else to keep in mind, and that is Israel. The promised land is much more than modern day Israel. Uh, you know, we see the tiny little nation of Israel, which is a very tiny part of that center of that map. But what is the true Israel? God says to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt, the Nile, to the great river in the river Euphrates. So basically on the map from the Nile to the Euphrates River. All right. 3925, where God says, I will restore the fortunes of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel. They shall forget their shame. Uh, when I brought them back from the peoples and gathered them from the enemy's lands and vindicated my holiness in the sight of many nations. This is the fulfillment of Jacob's trouble. Remember Jacob's trouble? There is... A cutting off of two-thirds, a taking one-third and refining them, and then bringing redemption and blessing. Then they shall know that I am the Lord their God, and I will not hide my face anymore from them. When I pour out my Spirit upon the house of Israel, this is the new covenant that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, by the prophet Jeremiah, to be fulfilled by Jesus Christ, as explained in Hebrews and in Revelation. Okay, so then that takes us back to the sixth seal, the breaking of the sixth seal. And this is monumental, because when Jesus Christ opens the sixth seal, what? There's a great earthquake which we've read about in Ezekiel and in Isaiah and in the Olivet Discourse. And then that's going to be followed by the sun becoming black as sackcloth, the full moon like blood, the stars falling to the earth as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. Once again, we've read these prophecies in Isaiah, in Ezekiel, in Joel. And so then the question is, all right, we've got these prophecies. We were reading about this in, in the uh, sixth seal, is there, is there any precedent to this? And the answer is absolutely yes. And the precedent, just by the way, is also the first coming of the Messiah. So we got the second coming of the Messiah, the breaking of the, of the sixth seal, and we got the first coming of the Messiah during Jesus' crucifixion. Just before he died, from the sixth hour, there's what? There was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. So three hours darkness, pitch black. And then, of course, Jesus gave up his spirit, and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, and the earth shook. Earthquakes and rocks were split, and tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and they were seen throughout the holy city, and appeared to many. And then, just like that, they're gone. So, yes, there has been a precedent. Reading on on the sixth seal, then kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals, the rich, the powerful, everyone, slave and free. What? They hid themselves in caves among the rocks of the mountains. And they say, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Have we read about this before? Absolutely. Remember, Jesus Christ said he came to what? Fulfill the law and the prophets. As the prophet Isaiah says, enter the rock and hide in the dust before the terror of Yahweh and the splendor of his majesty. Jeremiah says, uh, the earth shall mourn and the heavens above shall what? Be dark. For I have spoken. I have purpose. I have not relented, nor will I turn back. And Zephaniah, the prophet there, says a day of wrath is that day a day of distress and anguish, of ruin and devastation, of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet blast, a battle cry against fortified cities, against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind. That's the day of the Lord. Then we have this 
interlude, this intermission, this parathetical chapter, and now we're talking about Revelation 7, God's seal on the 144,000, that uh, they were given a seal of the living God and with the instructions to the angels of do not harm until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Sealed by God. Who is this? Well, first and foremost, this is the inscription of Yahweh's and Yeshua's name that's going to be readily visible to spiritual beings. Described in uh, Revelation 14, where I looked, and there before me was the Lamb on Mount Zion, and with him the, this 144,000 who what? Had his name, the Lamb, and his Father's name, the Father, written on their foreheads. Revelation 22, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. So this is basically the, the, the first fruits, or at least the first fruits, we think, of uh, the Jewish people uh, that uh, have not accepted Yeshua as Messiah yet, but God in his omniscience knows that they will be part of the remnant. And they were from all the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, so, and so their, their, their sealing uh, is also going to identify them with what? The Christians as well. Because we also have a seal on us given to us by the Holy Spirit uh, that we looked at in Corinthians, Ephesians, and Second Timothy. And then the other half of Revelation 7 is really interesting. Because now we're looking at great tribulation of saints, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, where we saw in the fifth seal they were coming up from the altar and told the rest, these are standing before the throne. And they got palm branches in their hands and are crying out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And then you got all the angels and living creatures and the elders worshiping God. So what's going on here? Uh, this, you know, this is a great multitude. Uh, and this passage, by the way, is also the centerpiece uh, to the pre-wrath rapture theory. They're saying, ah, this is the rapture. This is the resurrection. Uh, based on the sixth seal announcement for the great day of their wrath has come. The saints, well, that would be the church up here in heaven. That's here in Revelation 7. And God's wrath is executed what? The following chapters, 8 and 9, 15 through 19. Uh, is that the case? We will explore this in great detail, so I'm not going to say any more there. But then we got one of these all-knowing elders addressing John saying, who are these? Well, the elder is not asking John the question. He's making a statement with a question mark on the end. Who are these clothed in white robes and where have they come, John? John, of course, says, sir, you know. And he says, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes. They've made them white in the blood of lamb. So they are coming out of the great tribulation. The word coming here is in the present and imperfect tense, which means it's a past action in progress, but it has not been completed in the context of this verse. So this tells us that the great tribulation is still in progress, and they're coming out of it. They shall hunger no more, nor thirst any more. So chances are these are martyrs that came out of the great tribulation because they did not accept the mark of the beast. And so therefore, they were not eating, they were not drinking. Uh, they were probably uh, not living in, uh, in buildings. And so they hunger no more, thirst no more. Uh, the sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For what? The Lamb in the midst of the throne. So the Lamb is still here in chapter 7. He has not gone out upon the earth. Uh, so this, the second coming has not quite happened yet. Another interesting point. But anyway, he will be their shepherd and will guide them the springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Then we get to chapter 8, the seventh seal, finally, and the golden censer. So what happens here? 
first and foremost, chapter 8 is another formal ceremony. The Lamb opens the seventh seal. There's a half hour of silence in heaven. And then John sees seven angels, and they line up before God, and they're given seven trumpets. So this is a very formal, solemn event. Uh, also, um, we had read earlier that there was four angels holding back the four winds of the earth in Revelation 7, which might be why there's silence, because stop and think about it. Uh, so much noise comes from wind. You take away the wind from rushing through trees, from whipping around uh, mountain valleys or buildings. Uh, no wind on the seas, flat, calm, and everything is silent. But we got this formal ceremony of another angel that came and stands before the altar, and he has a golden censer, and with that he's, there's much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And then the smoke of their incense with the prayers of the saints rise before God from the hand of this angel. And then the angel takes the censer. And what does he do? He fills it with fire from the altar and he throws it down on earth. Okay? And then that starts the blowing of the seven trumpets by the seven angels. So hopefully uh, this review will kind of help us get more of a feel of a total picture of what's going on, not only in Revelation, but what uh, is going on in fulfilled prophecies uh, in the law and the Old Testament. Obviously, there's more prophecies, but they just build on top of each other. This is just all a culmination of uh, what has been prophesied through the ages coming into reality in Revelation. So we'll stop there. And, uh, yeah, amen and amen, and there will be much more to come.